All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I know we will have more folks trickling in in the next five minutes, but I'll just go ahead and start off by making a land acknowledgement, which I think um, is especially important to consider and reflect on in the topics that we're discussing tonight. Spaces recognizes the land upon which our building resides as the ancestral homeland of the Haudenosaunee and other Great Lakes tribes. We further acknowledge the thousands of indigenous people who now call this region home as a result of forced migration, dispossession of ancestral homelands and territories and other reasons. We affirm their right as past, present and future caretakers of this land. We make this statement recognizing that intentionally or not, we have participated in ongoing settler colonialism, a term that is generally recognized to mean the removal, erasure and forced supplantation of indigenous peoples. We commit to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Um, to introduce spaces, I see a lot of familiar names um, and some new names too. So for folks who are new to our programs, spaces is a resource and public forum for artists who explore and experiment. We are the only alternative art organization in Ohio that solely commissions new artist projects, serving as a national model for how to materialize artists' ideas and interact with audiences. Our success is rooted in providing artists the kind of support rarely seen outside of major institutions, which has led to ambitious new projects that have reached an international stage and expanded artists' practices. Um, so next, I would like to introduce our two artists whose current exhibit on view at Spaces instigated this panel and brought us all together tonight. Hung No is an artist whose research-based practice pra connects personal and political histories using a conceptual, interdisciplinary, and often collaborative approach. Performance and alternately, the absented body and its traces are strongly present in her work, which often asks how the ideological imprints itself on our material realities and how we make and how we might make visible the process of our own subject formation. She was awarded the Fulbright US Scholar Grant in Vietnam to realize a project that examine, examines the colonial history of surveillance in Vietnam and the anti-colonial strategies of resistance vis-a-vis -vis the activities of female organizers and liaisons. Her work described as deftly and defiantly decolonial and what intersectional feminist art looks like has exhibited at the MoMA MCA Chicago Nasan Collective, the Factory Contemporary Art Center, among others. She has been included in the 20, 2005 Prague Biennial and Prospect 5 Triennial in New Orleans. Hong An Trong uses photography, sound, video, and performance to examine histories of war and immigrant and refugee narratives through a decolonial framework. By interrogating archival materials, she examines the production of knowledge through structures of time and memory. Her interdisciplinary projects are premised on the concept that aesthetic battles are also political and ideological battles. She received her MFA from the University of California, Irvine, and has a fellow and was a fellow at the Whitney Independent Study Program. So um, Hong An and Huang's exhibit, To the People of That Future, We Leave That Legacy, um, is up until tomorrow, actually. It closes tomorrow, June 3rd. So those of you who are locals can still catch it if you come by sometime between um, 12 and 5 or by appointment. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to the artists. Thank you so much, Layla. Um, so first, we want to just thank the spaces for hosting us for the exhibition as well as this programming. It's been really meaningful for both of us. Um, and I want to thank all of the panelists who are here today and everyone attending. We're going to start out with a little bit of contextualization of our project and then walk you through how you might see it in the actual space. So if Layla, if you could start that slideshow. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks again, Layla, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this panel came together with a lot of support from many people in Cleveland and the community that we engage with. So we're really, um, yeah, really honored to have you all here with us. Um, so this project kind of pivots around two historical events and the kind of restaging of it through a video, which is kind of the main component of the project. And the two events are both in the same time period, but separate moments and wouldn't normally get typically narrated together. 
The first is the 1947 UN debates over Resolution 181, which partitioned Palestine into a Jewish and an Arab state. And then also um, scenes from a fictional film called The Middleton Family Goes to the World Fair from the 1939 World's Fair. And by combining these two moments that are in the same kind of time period, this project kind of excavates the seeds of destructive forces of Western diplomacy based on the twin powers that we still feel and are reverberating today, colonialism and capitalism. So this time period, of course, the 1930s and 40s were marked by a lot of global instability and violence. And so the World's Fair that took place in Flushing um, in 1930 year, 39 was an exposition that really was you know, kind of championing and sort of celebrating in the industrial a kind of industrial explosion and thinking about the concept of the future really rooted in sort of this really fervent belief that capitalism was going to really um, uh, be be you know save 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 the world and save save the U.S. Um, it was the first um, World Fair to also organize organize around the concept of the future with slogans such as the world of tomorrow and the eyes of the fair are on the future. And so six years later in 1945, at the end of World War II, of course, the UN was founded with the intended mission of preventing future wars between, between countries and to provide a platform for diplomacy. Um, so at the start of this, and of course, like part of our panel here tonight is going to really sort of be examining this moment and the, the, the kind of start of the UN, the, the, the building of the UN. Um, but the intended mission of it, you know, um, sort of, again, with this first sort of moving of, uh, or, or, or the first, first kind of event that really kind of anchored their, their founding was the debates around the resolution of 181 in 1947. Um, they were, before they moved into their permanent headquarters in Manhattan, they were in Flushing Meadow, which was the same location as the World's Fair in 1939. And that site was kind of the pivot point or the kind of instigation for us to be thinking about also both the connection between these two events, both physically, but also ideologically. Um, so maybe we could go to the next slide and just uh, contextualize the video a bit more. Yeah. Um, so um, this is a, the installation of the video in, at Spaces with a vinyl text that says an audible silence on the right. Um, so as Hongan was saying, the video um, that anchors the project, it's, it's titled The Book of the Record of Time. Sorry, the book of the record of the time capsule of Kupoloi made to withstand the effects of time. Um, and it's restaging these two events. We had worked with a team of professional and non-professional actors um, to perform a reading where these two events are happening in the same space and the camera is moving almost as its own character, witnessing speeches from the UN and then moving over and witnessing scenes from the Middleton family visits the World's Fair. Um, and it takes place in that abandoned building um, in Flushing Meadow, it actually was the uh, part of the Queens Museum, but was in a part of the space that was no longer in use. So even though it takes place over 50 years ago, those, those de debates are just very present and chillingly prescient to what is happening today. Mm -hmm. So we're asking ourselves, like, what does it mean to utter those speeches? And by reperforming those parts of the debate and the Middleton family drama, we're thinking of this as a kind of an act of excavating the historical site. And you'll see that what we mean also by the ruins of the space when, when we look at the film, um, exploring this concept of the ruins as, a, as an allegory for, for understanding what's happening today around these questions of capitalism, colonialism, diplomacy, and technology. Um, and just to so, note one thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that, so what also instigated us um, instigated the project also was the fact that the Queens Museum was about to be gut renovated. And so the ruins of the space was going to be, you know, kind of erased through this sort of, um, you know, renovation into what we know the Queens Museum to be now, which is a really beautiful glassy palace that kind of erases the history of, you know, these really um, 
uh, especially the debates around um, around um, Palestine in that in that same location. This is a solemn moment, solemn in the history of the world, in the history of this great, let us hope at least great organization. The United Nations is today on trial. The world is watching and will see how it acquits itself. In the first place, where is the authority of the United Nations to rule sovereign states? How is Palestine to be independent? What sort of independence? What is the solution that we are invited to endorse and to attempt to carry through? In effect, one proposal before the United Nations General Assembly says that we shall decide, not the people of Palestine with no provision for self-determination, no provision for consent of the governed, what type of independence shall Palestine have? We shall call Palestine independent and sovereign but Palestine shall belong to us and shall be not the apple of many and in different direction looking eyes, but shall become the apple of discord between East and West, lest perchance the unity which our name so wistfully proclaims may have a chance to establish itself. We shall first cut the body of Palestine into three parts of a Jewish state and three parts of an Arab state. We shall then have Jaffa enclave, and Palestine's heart, Jerusalem, shall forever be an international city. Having cut Palestine up in that manner, we shall then put its bleeding body upon a cross forever. This is not going to be temporary. This is permanent. Palestine shall never belong to its people. It shall always be stretched upon the cross. But the problem is this. In the first place, where is the authority of the United Nations to rule sovereign states? Not the people of Palestine with no provision for self-determination, no provision for consent of the governed. In the second place, the members of the assembly are aware that the Arabs of Palestine will not cooperate in setting up an Arab state. I am not talking of bloodshed. I am not talking of violence. They will not cooperate. How is the general assembly then going to set up the Arab state? How is it going to provide for the Arab state's defense? How is it going to provide for all the numerous functions that a working government has to carry out? Where has the General Assembly provided the authority for that? These questions have been put repeatedly, but they have not been dealt with. All that has received attention is the problem of how are they to deal with the surrounding Arab states should they cause trouble. But this is not a problem about which I am worried. I am hoping, as a matter of fact, I am convinced that the Arab states, being members of this organization, will not do nor attempt anything which would be contrary to the obligations we have undertaken under the charter as members of this organization. But how is the General Assembly going to set up the Arab state if the people say, no, we are not cooperating? Where are you going to get the services? Who is going to keep order? These problems were put, but where have they been provided for? If force becomes necessary for the purpose of setting up an Arab state, if force becomes necessary for the purpose of setting up an Arab state, where is it going to come from? Who is going to contribute? What is going to provide for it? From where will the administration come, the finances? This will be a continuing situation which may become a festering sore in the international body. Forces and finances may be required in ever increasing volume as the experience of the mandatory power confirms. Why is the United Kingdom sick of the mandate over Palestine? We now come to the question of whether the plan is workable in general. As I have said, the representative of the United States has expressed the hope that given support of the surrounding Arab states and of the people of Palestine, the scheme might work. Why is the United Kingdom sick of the mandate over Palestine? The surrounding Arab states will certainly not support this experiment. All that can be expected of them as states is that they do nothing in contrary to their obligations under this charter. But the Arabs of Palestine have declared that they do not want to cooperate. And the members of the assembly must remember that this plan is not an experiment. It is not like the experiment regarding the interim committee, which was set up for a year. If that fails, it can be scrapped, and the General Assembly can then adopt another scheme 
On the contrary, this plan is proposed as a permanent solution. If it fails, the United Nations has failed. It is a permanent system, and it pledges the credit, the honor, and indeed the very existence of the United Nations. If it fails, the United Nations has failed. Is the General Assembly prepared to make this gamble? Let us pause and consider before we launch the United Nations upon a course which commits it to carrying through a scheme which lacks moral justification, is beyond the legal and ju jurisdiction authority of the United Nations, and is, and is, in fact, impossible of achievement. In making this futile, this fatal attempt, you set at naught the wishes of 66% of the people of Palestine. You destroy the fate and the trust of all the surrounding and neighboring states in the fairness and impartiality of the United Nations, particularly having regard to what has been happening during these last three or four days, the maneuvers, even with regard to the meetings of the General Assembly that great and honorable nations are descending to. You take the gravest risk of impairing beyond all possibility of repair any chance of real cooperation between East and West, and thus forcibly driving what in effect amounts to a Western wedge in the heart of the Middle East. Our vote today, if it does not endorse partition, does not rule out other situations and other solutions. Our vote, if it endorses partition, bars all peaceful solution. Let him who will shoulder that responsibility, my appeal to you is, do not shut out that possibility. The United Nations should seek and strive to unite and bring together rather than to divide and put asunder. So I just wanted to add that uh, this was actually our first official collaboration, me and Hong An's. Um, we started it in 2009. That's when we shot the video. Um, and we have not had, we have not been able to realize the project fully, um, you know, um, because of a, a few different reasons. And I think some that were, were tied to some of the, the um, content of the work, how, um, the issues that I was bringing up that a lot of art spaces were not able to take on. So, um, but we're really happy that we were able to develop it with spaces because as Hong An mentioned, we were able to engage with the, the Cleveland Palestinian community to expand it. And actually there was a lot um, that came from our conversations that um, went into how we ended up realizing the installation. Um, Hong An, do you wanna talk about the inaudible silence and add anything else? Yeah, I'll just this is just a, a uh, the screenshot of the um, a newspaper article that came out in the Guardian the day after the the vote um, in the UN, and we were just struck by this phrase an audible silence. So, you know, everything that you know the newspapers were reporting, and obviously the you know in the video you'll see there's about maybe a, a dozen speeches um, from various um, delegates. Um, both for and against the partition, but, you know, so many of the, you know, what really struck us was how, how really it feels like no time has passed in terms of the arguments of many of the delegates. Um, and this phrase, an audible silence of just the kind of, um, yeah, the, the kind of um, the echo chamber of just, you know, having this, um, this vote kind of portend the violence to come in the future. Um, so we skip over yeah. to, um, let's see the map. Yeah. Yes, that one. Great. Thank you. Um, so when you walk into the space, this is what you encounter. This is a, you know, a 12 foot high wall. Um, I think it's about 25 feet wide and, um, it's, it's based starting with the UN map of um, Palestine partitioning it, um, from 1947 and then overlaying it with uh, contemporary information from a map, um, provided by the BBC from 2014. Um, so what you're seeing is that 
that original map and you can see the shape um, of uh, Palestine and that was originally Palestinian land. And um, we were thinking of erasure, you know, the erasure of that land over time. So you can see the, the kind of medium um, shaded area is the, the partition into a um, into the Arab and Jewish state. And then the, the lighter areas, the areas where the chalk is the densest, those are the currently still held territories, um, uh, Palestinian territories. And you can get a slighter, um, slightly closer view on the next slide. Um, so we're thinking of, you know, the, the erasure of, of the chalk also, you know, chalk is associated with um, education, but also this this uh, palimpsest quality of uh, of the drawing and, and different periods of history overlaid on one another. Um, can we go to the next slide, Leila? Um, and then opposite of that map on one side of the wall are printouts of excerpts of those speeches in the UN printed on newsprint and hung in this grid. And um, we, you know, we really just, we wanted viewers to spend a bit more time with different parts of the speeches, with the speeches in general, but different parts of it, especially ones that were directed towards the legal or illegal nature of the um, partition. Um, a lot of language that was evoking almost like a, a surgical um, violence that was, was happening on the, the land and its people. Um, and uh, different ways in which the delegates were arguing for or against. So if we could go to the next slide, there's a, this is a detail of the, the speech that we just heard, which we should mention was from the representative from Pakistan. Um, and then the next one um, that I'd, I'd like to read out, we're often apt to read history backwards, which I submit is a very wrong method of reading history. History in order to be properly appreciated has to be read forwards. One must put oneself behind the events which one desires to evaluate and judge and appraise them. Um, and then we we installed it and the the the, <laughs> the venting system kind of took over much to our delight so we just we made a short video of that so this is the experience you would have of it in the space um there was something that was you know really powerful about these speeches that are so delicate on paper having so much power can we go to the next slide So also in the space is just um, this pile of rubble. Um, we wanted to really kind of draw out that uh, metaphor that we see in the video in thinking about, again, this excavation of the site, but of course, again, the you know ruins as a kind of metaphor for the state of diplomacy and nation states more broadly speaking. Um, and thinking about, of course, like there's a lot uh, to be said about sort of thinking about ruins as always being bound up with notions of the future. Um, but to kind of really um, anchor the speeches and what you're reading on the walls opposite in terms of the weight of those words, but yet it's flimsiness of, of also just, uh, you know, the, the material sort of floating into the, you know, um, in, in the air this sort of disastrous notion of the future that was foreshadowed by the delegates who were arguing against partition, but also the kind of false promise of the future as bound up with both the ideals and structuring principles of the UN and the World's Fair. So both thinking about this both as like an excavation of those ruins, but also already the future that we have seen. <laughs> and as you can see, I think the next, is the next slide have the, yeah, there we go. Um, this phrase, we have seen the future, um, which is a phrase that comes from a pin that was created for the World's Fair that year in 1939. So, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so that's the original one, um, two, two different versions of it. Um, so this idea of the notion that the, this idea of the a future kind of bound up with um, of the bound up with the past. Um, and so we also made some some pins that people could take away as well. 
So literally, we have seen the future, the future that was predicted in that moment in, in that moment in 1947 with those arguments um, came to pass. And we are living that future now. So the last element in the um, in the in, in the insulation is a single print um, that you see here to the left of the printed speeches wall, um, and it's a print of a, an image of a globe thistle, um, and it was through conversations um, that we had again with um, a group of an, of, of really generous. Um, activists and organizers around um, Palestine in Cleveland, including Malik and Omar Kurdi, Mohammed Faraj, uh, Dr. Shireen Nasir, Nadine Abdusa, Ab Abu Sada, Chance Zarub, and George Harb, um, all of whom met with us multiple times to talk through the project. And through those conversations, this idea of kind of countering this very kind of very common metaphor of ruins when it comes to imagery and representations of Palestine um, with uh, an image that would kind of, you know, be a kind of counterpoint for thinking about the, the, the um, Palestinian, um, resist, Palestinian resistance. So- There's a good um, close up on the next slide. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. So this image, um, Again, the globe thistle, Dr. Uh, Nasser actually um, mentioned it as this sort of uh, plant that grows everywhere in Palestine um, and really is a, a really prominent feature of a lot of the landscape. Um, it's a very persistent and very resilient plant that, um, that grows through the rubble and grows through all kinds of conditions um, in the landscape. So we printed it, um, it's with gold, um, gold ink on um, black, black paper. Yeah, and we should shout out to Zygote. We printed um, at their, their space during our residency and was really um, wonderful to have that resource while we we're in Cleveland. Yeah, and the image was found, just to mention that it, it also came from the archives. Um, how long do you remember which one? <laughs> um, I believe it's in the National Archives. It's a stereograph. So it's 3D if you were to look at it through, um, you know, one of those lenses. And it was taken in Palestine. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Um, part of the work we were able to do while we were there was um, a a program, um, an oral history workshop program that we um, co-led with George Harb from the Arab American Museum and Fatin Ode from the West from West Bank Narratives. Um, part of our goals for the project, part, part of our goals for every project, I think that we do together, are pedagogical. Um, so we often use a project as a starting point for conversations or more work, kind of a jumping off point. And uh, you know, we were thinking of oral histories as a kind of counter testimony to official um, institutional record. And also as a way for local Palestinians to connect with one another and to hear each other's stories. So if you look on the next slide, um, the, and during that evening, we were able to gather with um, four, at least four generations of Palestinians here represented our three generations. Um, some, some of them who were older than the state of Israel itself, and they were talking about their experiences during the partition. Um, the groups were, were comprised of people who were telling their stories, those that were learning to record and interview each other, and those who were just there to simply listen. Um, Hong on, do you want to add anything to this? Um, I don't think so. I, yeah, I think also, yeah, part of um, this program for us was also, um, again, coming out of the conversations um, with Malik and Omar and others was really wanting to create a space for um, Palestinians in Cleveland to really gather and sort of sit with the project, but also have a space where they, you know, could, could connect with each other and um, really share space and um, and have, um, you know, both a sense, you know, sense of shared shared experience. Um, so it was a. Uh, it was a, pro a program that really came out of the conversations that we had. So 
Yeah, and huge credit goes to both George and Fatin, who um, already are doing this work locally um, and have their own communities and followings that they were generously, um, you know, bringing to this event. Um, so I think that is is it. Um, you know, of course, we'd love you to see the the exhibition itself, but we're so happy that for everyone for joining us today, and so happy to to share this evening with you all. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Layla to introduce the rest of the evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, those images were beautiful too, getting a good look at them after, you know, having experienced it in person. Um, it was it was incredibly moving. Um, so I'm actually gonna pass it over to Malik. So Malik Khawam is um, a Cleveland-based uh, attorney and organizer, and also a board member of the Arab Americans Young Professional Network. Um, and Malik has played a really integral role in the kind of, you know, connecting us with Palestinian communities in Cleveland, um, connecting the artists to Cleveland communities and vice versa. So I'm going to pass it to him and he'll introduce the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Layla. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. I want to express my appreciation for Huang and Hong An uh, and share our gratitude on behalf of the local folks who are working on this initiative for all of their work um, and this effort. You know, they gave me the impression very early on that this exhibit was about uh, making a space uh, and an opportunity for community gathering and community engagement, um, you know, as equally as much as it was about the exhibit itself. Um, so today's panel and the narrative workshop are both the result of um, that commitment to this community. And I also have to convey my appreciation for Leila Khoury and Tiziana at Spaces for providing this forum for an ever important conversation. Uh, Leila is an old friend and courageous artist and definitely deserves her flowers for helping bring this together and being unwavering uh, in her commitment to the Palestinian and MENA community. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists today. Um, we have um, a great set. Joining us from The Ohio State University is Professor of International and Comparative Law, John Quigley. Professor Quigley completed three tours at Harvard prior to joining The Ohio State faculty uh, and was also a visiting professor in Tanzania. His numerous publications include books and articles on human rights, the United Nations, war and peace, Eastern European law, African law, and of course, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, in 95, he was the recipient of the Ohio State University Distinguished Scholar Award. Uh, he formally held the title of President's Club Professor at Law. His record and CV are too lengthy to distill here, so thank you, Dr. Professor Quigley, for joining us today. Joining us from New York City, we are grateful to receive uh, Amin Hussein and Natasha Dillon. Amin is an artist, organizer, and part-time faculty at NYU. He is a JD of Indiana University and an LLM of Columbia Law. His research and teaching interests span debt and financialization, globalization, and political economy, social movements, and cultures of resistance, race, class, and ethnicity in media and post-colonial theory. Uh, most recently, Amin taught a course titled Art, Activism, and Beyond uh, at NYU. Um, Natasha is a writer, artist, educator, and organizer um, with a, PA, a, a BA in mathematics from St. Stephen's College, uh, University of Delhi, and attended the Whitney Independent Study Program in New York and School of International Center of Photography. She's a PhD candidate at the Department of Media Study, uh, University of Buffalo in New York. Uh, and has lectured at major universities in the United States and abroad, including at Brown University, SUNY Stonebrook, University of Chicago, MIT, among others. Um, together, Amin and Natasha are MTL, a collective that joins research and activism with artistic practice. MTL is a collective, uh, collective is a core member of the Gulf Labor Coalition. Uh, it's also a founding member of Decolonial Culture Front and Global Ultra Luxury Faction. In addition to their inspiring work at Decolonize This Place, Natasha and Amin uh, have completed um, a film on this lamb about the Palestinian struggle. 
And moderating today's conversation is Dr. Corey, who holds a joint appointment in the History and Comparative Religion Department at Cleveland State University. His specialty is in the history and religion of the Islamic Middle East and North Africa. His research focuses upon the use of religious imagery for political legitimization in North African states during the late medieval and early modern period. He's also taught at El Akhwain University in Morocco and at the University of Jordan in Amman uh, on Fulbright fellowships. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Quigley, uh, who will begin his presentation. Thank you, Malik. Um, there's been so much said already, I, I don't know exactly where to start. I mean, there are four or five different strands I could bring out of what has been said by Wong and Hangan about the uh, exhibit, um, <clears throat> or what Layla said uh, at the beginning about the Haudenosaunee, uh, because uh, there's, a, of course, a very strong link uh, as between what happened to the Haudenosaunee in uh, what is now called Ohio uh, and what has happened to the Palestinians um, uh, in Palestine. That is, they've both been forced out of their uh, indigenous uh, lands by Western colonialism. Uh, the settler colonialism that Hong was talking about um, is, is equally applicable uh, to the two situations. So um, it's most appropriate that, that this um, discussion is happening in the location where it is, the, the, the spaces uh, space uh, uh, where uh, attention is devoted to this uh, uh, situation. Um, <clears throat> Um, and, and Cleveland as well. Uh, you might think of Palestine as very far from Cleveland. Um, during the time that that um, uh, Pakistani delegate was making that speech uh, that, that we heard uh, in 1947 at the United Nations, uh, during that time, very strong lobbying for a, a Jewish state uh, in Palestine was coming from uh, an entity called the Jewish Agency, which in turn had been set up by a, a, a group called the Zionist Organization. Um, and the Jewish Agency uh, had its strongest backing uh, in the United States. Uh, and one of the prime uh, movers in the Jewish Agency in the United States uh, was a rabbi from Cleveland uh, by the name of Hillel Silver. Uh, he was one of the principal spokespersons at the United Nations on behalf of the Jewish agency. So you would have heard him making a speech in opposition to what you heard from the Pakistani uh, delegate. Um, uh, and one of the, the more important sessions or conferences of the Jewish Agency had recently, in fact, been held in Cleveland. So, so Cleveland was very much at the center uh, of the promotion of Jewish statehood. Um, uh, but what the Pakistani delegate was saying, um, I think, was, was very true and represented what the third world, third world delegates at the United Nations were thinking. If you go back and read those documents, the ones that are on the wall in the exhibit, uh, you'll find that it is Western countries promoting the idea of a Jewish state um, uh, and third world delegates speaking against. Now, this isn't the UN of today. It was a UN during the period of colonialism, so there were not that many delegates uh, of that persuasion. Um, uh, and, and the Arabs were, were some of that. There were five Arab states that were members of the UN uh, at the time. Uh, and you had uh, India and, and Pakistan. Uh, and uh, India and Pakistan were very strong in support of the, the, uh, the Palestinian position uh, at the time. 
Um, but the, uh, the Western delegates more or less went along with the uh, idea of setting up a Jewish state, which was really the idea uh, of what I'll call the three major uh, Western uh, states of the period. Uh, and I'm using Western in a broad sense here uh, to include uh, Britain, to include the United States and to include the Soviet Union, because all three of them were, uh, uh, you could say, participants on the side of, of taking over the, uh, the country of Palestine from its, its population um, uh, in slightly different roles. Uh, Britain, first of all, after the the war that it uh, won against the Ottoman or Turkish Empire, the First World War. Uh, Britain took over the territory um, uh, and wanted to control it. Um, uh, it, for that purpose, thought that it would be useful uh, to have a population of people who were beholden to Britain uh, because it knew that the Arabs of Palestine did not want Britain there at all. Um, uh, so it, uh, the British government formed uh, what I'm calling now in a book I'm writing, uh, what I'm calling a symbiotic relationship uh, with the Zionist organization. Um, uh, the idea being that Britain would uh, sponsor the idea of some kind of Jewish territorial entity in Palestine. Uh, and in return, uh, it would have a population there that would be coming in from Europe uh, that would be solidifying its hold on the, the territory. Um, so so that, uh, that's the way Britain got involved uh, uh, and managed to rule the area uh, up until the years just after the Second World War. Um, uh, and uh, it, it understood that what it was doing was less than uh, appropriate, uh, or say less than cricket, if I can use a, a, a British uh, uh, term, um, uh, that, or to, to put it another way, as a lawyer, I'll say what it was doing was blatantly illegal. Um, that is taking over somebody else's country. Um, uh, and it sought to give a kind of aura of legality to that uh, by enlisting the League of Nations, which was a very weak organization and didn't really have any way of, of shaping events. Um, but the British used the League of Nations uh, to get resolutions passed, to make it appear as if what Britain was doing was legal, to make it appear that bringing in a, a Jewish population from Europe would be legal. Um, uh, and, and, and so that, that was the essential dynamic uh, in the 1920s. The Arabs uh, did not go along with that. Uh, they objected to it. They demonstrated against it. Uh, they wrote legal petitions uh, against it. Some of the more interesting documents I've found uh, on this whole issue uh, are documents drafted by an organization that was called the Palestine Arab Congress, uh, which was a, a, a political group, I suppose you would say, um, that formed around 1921-22. Uh, and wrote petitions to the British government saying, you know, essentially, you know, get out of here. Uh, we want to have our country. We don't want to be under you. We don't want the League of Nations here. We don't want you. Uh, there should be a government representing the population. Uh, we demand self-determination. We should have a legislative assembly. Uh, you have no business, you, the British government, you have no business legislating in, in our country. Um, uh, and, and they made that argument uh, in, in, a, in a very sophisticated uh, uh, manner. Um, it, it, um, it, it, it didn't succeed. 
Uh, and eventually the population uh, resorted to a, a military revolt uh, in the 1930s that was put down very brutally by the British government. <clears throat> well, in any event, um, uh, I said I was going to talk about three countries uh, and I, I want to get to the other two uh, because we're, we're talking about this resolution, uh, 181, sometimes called the Partition Resolution that was adopted on the 29th of November, 1947, which is the day on which that, that Pakistani delegate was speaking in the General Assembly of the United Nations. Um, uh, uh, and uh, the, you also had that uh, interesting new, uh, newspaper clip that said the, what, uh, that the Arabs will not accept the UN uh, decision. Uh, uh, the journalist Alastair Cook, one of the uh, most prominent journalists of the day, uh, wrote that article. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that was certainly true. Arabs will not accept UN decision. Um, but as the Pakistani delegate was saying, uh, that was no surprise. I mean, they all knew that the, that the Arabs would not accept it. That, that resolution of the, of the General Assembly is sometimes depicted in, in, in a way as if, well, the UN decided what was good and right, uh, and the Jewish agency accepted it, and those, those silly Arabs did not, uh, as if you know, the onus is on the Arabs for not accepting that uh, uh, resolution. Well, everyone knew they were not going to accept it, I mean, they were the population of the country, two thirds of the country, and their country was being split up and being given in part, uh, in fact, more than 50% uh, part uh, to a, a population that represented only one third of the, of the, the inhabitants. Uh, and moreover, of that one third, most of them had only come into the country within the last few years. Um, uh, so this was seen as a very inequitable uh, operation on the part of, uh, you know, by the, uh, the, the Arabs of Palestine, that, that this was being uh, done to them. Um, and if you read the, the, the transcripts, uh, and so I'm very, so happy that, that the artists have, have put those up uh, in the exhibit. If you read those, you will not find anyone saying this is a fair and just way to deal with Palestine. What they were saying was, um, and this is even the Western delegates, the Latin American delegates, they're saying, well, we don't really know what to do. The Arabs and the Jews don't seem to be able to get along. All we can think of is to split the territory we know that that's not going to go over well with the Arabs. We know that they're not going to cooperate uh, in, in the splitting of their territory, um, but we can't think of anything else to do. Um, uh, and and that, um, that resolution came about in part uh, because the General Assembly had set up a, uh, a committee to make a report to it, a report that was to go into the history and you know, decide what, what was appropriate. Um, uh, and that report essentially said that during the period of the League of Nations, the international community decided there should be a Jewish state in Palestine. Uh, so some of the representatives who spoke in the General Assembly in 1947, uh, said, well, you know, this was already uh, committed to the, the Jews of the world and, and we can't go back on that. Um, that was, uh, to put it in, in current, uh, the current vernacular, that was disinformation. Uh, the League of Nations had never done that. Uh, the UN committee that drew up that report uh, was perpetrating disinformation uh, based on the fact that they were given only a couple of months to, to draft a report um, uh, and they were coached in writing that report by the Jewish agency. So the Jewish agency in effect 
wrote the report that went to the General Assembly as being the report of the committee on, uh, on, on Palestine. Um, but um, to get to the other two uh, countries that uh, uh, were key in, in what transpired in um, 1947 in the uh, adoption of this resolution, um, one was the Soviet Union and one was the United States. Um, uh, now, the Pakistani delegate mentioned that the UN has no role about allocating territory, and he was absolutely correct. The, 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 this resolution was a recommendation. It was not anything that anyone had to follow, but, um, uh, but it was being backed by these two major powers of, of the day, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, uh, and it was rather clear that if the General Assembly went in this direction, it would probably be those countries that would, would carry the ball. Um, uh, and it was they that were promoting it. I think it's fair to say without the political backing in this uh, autumn of 1947 for that resolution, by the Soviet Union, by the United States, it would not have been adopted. Um, and you might ask, why did they promote it? Um, why did they think it was a good idea for there to be a Jewish state? Well, the answer is they didn't really think it was a good idea to have a Jewish state. Each had their own reasons for supporting the idea. Um, uh, and neither of them had come to the point of supporting Jewish statehood uh, until about, I would say, the month of September or October even of 1947. Um, in both countries, in both the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, the foreign uh, well, what was called the foreign ministry in the Soviet Union or the Department of State in the United States thought that it was a bad idea. Uh, the US Department of State opposed the idea of splitting the territory of Palestine and, and thereby creating uh, a Jewish state in, in a portion of Palestine. Uh, the Soviet foreign ministry had the same idea. Uh, they too thought it was a bad idea. The Soviet foreign ministry thought that the Soviet Union should back the Arabs. Uh, I mean, the Arabs, if you look at the entire region, uh, the Jewish population was, I don't know, three or four uh, percent. You had all of North Africa, all of the, uh, the Gulf uh, area. Um, uh, the Jews were not very numerous. Um, so simply from the standpoint of, of, uh, of national self-interest, they didn't see that, that promoting a Jewish state there was, was uh, useful for the Soviet Union. Um, uh, but uh, at the last minute, uh, Mr. Stalin, uh, who was calling the shots, uh, apparently came to the view uh, that it would be advantageous for the Soviet Union to back the idea of a, of a, a Jewish uh, state. Um, and that was largely because Britain was supporting Jordan very strongly, and Britain had a very strong role in Jordan, and Jordan was the, the most powerful Arab state at, at that time. So uh, Stalin saw it as an anti-British move for him to support the idea of a Jewish state, that he would be kind of easing Britain out of the picture and, and opening the way for the Soviet Union to have some kind of role in, in the, the region. Um, uh, and the Jewish agency had been lobbying the Soviet Union all during the Second World War um, uh, to, to, to get it to that position. So, so that's the Soviet side of it. The, the US side, as I say, the State Department uh, all through 1946, 47 was studying the matter um, and the State Department was uh, writing memoranda uh, saying that the United States uh, should support uh, the independence of Palestine. It should not support a Jewish state uh, in, in Palestine. 
Um, uh, but uh, uh, but then you you had a political criterion that came in to the picture. Uh, 1947, uh, 19, uh, the 1948 election was approaching um, uh, and Harry Truman was planning to run. Uh, everyone thought he was going to, to lose. Uh, he, he was running against the uh, the governor of New York, who had a much better political base than uh, than he had, uh, and uh, so he was desperate for uh, for political reasons uh, to take a position that would uh, enhance the the chances of his election. He was being pushed in that direction very strongly uh, by a uh, an advisor. Uh, who told him that he really needed to win the electoral votes in the state of New York uh, and that th there was a substantial Jewish population in, uh, in New York that, uh, that uh, in its majority at least supported the idea of Jewish statehood uh, and therefore that he had to uh, uh, go in the direction of, of supporting Jewish statehood. Um, so that, that's what he did. So you had the, the United States supporting the idea of, for the purpose of getting Harry Truman elected. You had the Soviet Union supporting the idea of Jewish statehood uh, because uh, it was thought that would be the way to get Britain out of the, of the region. Um, uh, and, and those were the, the two prominent voices at the United Nations at the time. Uh, if you listen to the speeches uh, from some of the smaller countries, they say things like, well, the Soviet Union and the United States think it's a good idea. Um, and, and they're the ones that are really going to have to do whatever is necessary to maintain the peace. So how can we go uh, against them? Um, so um, that, um, that is the, the political posture uh, at the time. But if you read those documents, the ones that are up on the, the wall in the exhibit, um, what comes through to me reading those documents um, is that this, it sounds like something that was written in the style of a Greek tragedy. You have delegate after delegate standing up and saying, you know, we know this isn't a good idea. We know it's not fair to the Arabs, um, but the Soviet Union and the United States want it, and we don't have any better ideas. What can what what can I do as Uruguay or Paraguay um, to impact the situation? Uh, we'll go along uh, with it. Um, so when the um, uh, resolution was adopted, uh, it was a very strange uh, uh, kind of uh, end game, you might say. Uh, you might remember the, the Pakistani delegate in, in that statement uh, talked about what has happened for the last three or four days. If you Did you pick up on that when he was uh, speaking? Um, what he had in mind was that they had scheduled a vote in the General Assembly on this resolution to partition Palestine. They had scheduled a vote for the date, I think it was November 25. Um, but the, um, uh, the, the, the smart money or the nose counting as of November uh, 25 uh, was that it would not have enough votes to pass. It required a two thirds majority in the General Assembly uh, and the, the nose counting had it that it was not going to make uh, two thirds. Uh, so the United States uh, took a hand in maneuvering uh, with the president of the General Assembly to delay a vote for a few days. That, those are the days the Pakistani delegate is talking about. Um, uh, and during those days, the United States put economic pressure threats of economic reprisal uh, on a number of countries, Panama, Liberia, number of countries that had said they were going to vote against this resolution. 
uh, they were put under pressure by the United States during those last couple of days, uh, which is something I've always found very strange because in September, when the matter was just coming up in, in the uh, uh, committee of the General Assembly, the US Secretary of State, who was George Marshall, the Marshall that you remember probably more from the Marshall Plan, uh, the plan to resuscitate Europe after the Second World War. Um, uh, he was, uh, as I say, against the idea of partition. Um, so what he told his staff was, we are going to uh, support this because, well, President Truman, he's calling the shots and he's saying we have to support it. But if it gets to November and we see that it is not going to pass, um, perhaps we will back off it. That's what he said in September. Um, but apparently Truman had really gotten to him by November because uh, he, he didn't take that posture. Um, uh, and the, the State Department went all out to, uh, to try to pressure the, um, uh, these uh, weaker countries. Um, uh, but then, and this is, is even perhaps harder to comprehend, um, within about three months after that resolution was adopted, the State Department had a kind of resurgence politically over Harry Truman. And the State Department said, we think this idea of partitioning Palestine is a bad idea. Uh, we think we should try something else because it's obviously not going to work. What happened was precisely what the Pakistani delegates said would happen that the Arabs were not going to cooperate in a project you know, to give away half of their country. Um, uh, uh, so by March of 1948, it was quite obvious that this whole idea was not going to uh, work. So the State Department came up with an idea for a trusteeship, a, a trusteeship that the UN would, would operate over Palestine. In effect, the UN would administer Palestine for a period of some unspecified number of years, uh, during which time the UN would try to work out some uh, permanent kind of, of solution. So that, that was the position of the State Department in, in 1948, March uh, and, and April. Um, then there was another turn in the opposite direction uh, in, um, in April of, of 1948. Um, the State Department at that time was trying to get this trusteeship idea through the General Assembly. Uh, and the General Assembly was receptive to doing that because everyone realized that the partition idea was, was a bad idea. Um, uh, and one afternoon, while they were in session uh, in New York, Flushing Meadow, as, as uh, Layla was uh, explaining earlier, uh, the General Assembly was in session. They were discussing the idea uh, of a trusteeship. Um, one of the delegates uh, kind of went to the uh, podium and got the microphone and he said, the news sources in New York are reporting that the United States is going to recognize a, a new state to be called Israel that's going to be declared imminently. Um, the US State Department had not heard about this news, but the news was true. It was Harry Truman. Harry Truman was saying, and was going to the press rather than to his own State Department saying that, he was going to recognize a Jewish state. And the Jewish agency was lobbying him very, very strongly at that point. This is the middle of, 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 uh, of the month uh, in uh, the end of, uh, of, of May, uh, the, the middle of May. 
of, of 1948. Um, so uh, at that point, the US uh, a delegate um, uh, to the head US delegate in the General Assembly um, uh, tried to figure out what was going on. They got on the phone to Washington because they, they didn't know if the press reports were true uh, because this completely undermined what they were trying to do, namely to get a trusteeship. Um, so they very quickly got on the phone to the State Department um, and figured out that it was indeed true. Um, and the US chief delegate was so embarrassed, uh, he refused to go back into the session of the General Assembly. He picked up his briefcase and walked home out of the session. Um, uh, and it was at that point then that the idea of a trusteeship uh, fell apart. Uh, the uh, a Jewish agency declared a, a state. Um, uh, the British pulled out uh, militarily um, uh, and the Arabs who had been put down militarily after their revolt in the 1930s uh, had no way of, of opposing the, the, uh, uh, the Jewish agency and its military uh, forces. Um, uh, but um, I mean, that I think is the, the long and short of, of this resolution. Um, uh, as uh, the delegate said, uh, the Pakistani delegate, there was no basis in law for it. I mean, there had been no basis in law for anything that had been done from the time of the First World War. Uh, uh, Britain had just come in, had overstayed its welcome, uh, had set up something that it called a mandate uh, in, uh, as a mechanism to rule in, in Palestine. Uh, that was something that was contemplated in the covenant of the League of Nations, um, uh, but, um, but in, in a way that was supposed to benefit the population. And what Britain did was to come in uh, and to work against the local population by bringing in an outside uh, uh, a population group that was intent on taking over the, uh, the country. Um, the uh, Arab countries at the UN did fight one kind of uh, a last uh, 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 stand kind of battle. They tried to get both the General Assembly and the Security Council to get a legal opinion about what should happen with Palestine. Uh, and the United Nations had a court called the International Court of Justice uh, that had the authority to give um, what were called advisory opinions on legal issues that come up in the work of the UN. And the Arab delegates, the, the, this is actually all five Arab countries, um, uh, went to, first to the General Assembly uh, and second to the Security Council and said, well, you know, this is a legal issue. What should happen with this territory? Let's ask the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion. Um, uh, and they raised that actually in October of 1947, first in the General Assembly. This is a few weeks before the resolution 181 was adopted, the Arab states said, you know, we shouldn't go ahead and vote on this resolution 181. We should get a legal opinion as to what should happen. Um, uh, and that proposal needed a, 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 a majority vote in the General Assembly for the question to be asked of the International Court of Justice. Um, uh, and they took a vote on it and the vote was split 50-50, the same number of votes in favor, the same number against, which meant by the rules of, of, of parliamentary order, it did not, uh, be, did not get adopted. But, but that shows you how much the members of the General Assembly uh, were, uh, you know, 
of two minds on all of this. And they didn't really think that this idea of splitting was such a great one. They thought that uh, that going to the uh, court for an opinion was a good idea. Um, So in any event, that didn't work. Then uh, after the events of, of 1948 and, and uh, the, what the Palestinians call the Nakba, the, the uh, Jewish agency forces were forcing the population out of the country. Uh, by July of 48, uh, the issue was raised in the Security Council of the United Nations because the Security Council also has the power to ask for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. Um, uh, and, and there too, it almost passed, uh, but, but not quite. Uh, so there was never any legal opinion rendered on, on, on what was uh, supposed to happen, what should happen uh, with this uh, territory. Um, I think I should probably stop at that point because we have much more on our agenda here and we need to have some space for uh, for questions. So I think I will turn it uh, back uh, to whoever it is I'm turning it back to, whether that is that Malik or Layla uh, or Dr. Corey, um, but uh, whichever, uh, please uh, take over. Thank you so much, Dr. Quigley. Um, and I am going to hand it over to um, Amin and Natasha, so. Thank you so much. Um, we've learned a lot just from listening about the history from John and also just it was beautiful to see the exhibition that's still up and uh, it's gonna be in dialogue with the film that we show. So I think it would be nice even for us to see these things alongside each other. Um, Yeah, I I think what we decided to do is maybe just create a little bridge so what we say doesn't seem out of context because really the aesthetics that people are going to experience, you know, that way of sensing the world is it's coming out of our organizing and our thinking around Palestine and what does it mean to say free Palestine and how does Palestine get free? And I think that, you know, the anti a lot of things, anti-Zionist, of course, and all of that, but I think that there's an orientation towards desire. And if we were to think about the post-colonial era, it really was never post, especially for Palestinians. But I think more broadly, it isn't for anyone. And that you can have the global South in the United States in multiple places. So thinking of international relations simply as like NGOs or you know these organizations like the UN or and, and nation states and this Westphalian civilization of law and bullshit is part of like, <clears throat> part of what we're from experience have felt, not just as Palestinian people, but just through my lifetime, living the first uprising, thinking about nation states. It's interesting because I think that people wanted to get free and that got translated into this idea you get free within a certain frame with a certain comprehension. You're comprehensible, com- you, you are legible to this Westphalian civilization that seeks the conquer and, and, and thinks of values in a certain way and extraction and all this stuff, which means that anyone else that wanted to get free in a decolonization era had to subscribe to their bullshit. And even in the context of the Bandung conference where people tried to create a third way, there was no way for that. Right? So then people that are living right now as Palestinians, but also just in general, who want to get free. Well, this government doesn't fucking represent us. Well, these borders, if the, if the idea of a government and it's recognized internationally and recognized by law as having a government that has you know, control over territory, that has control over borders, who? Which nation state that exists right now that isn't also an oppressor? of other minorities, of other people that got relegated, right? And it's almost insufficient for the project to only think of settler and native or indigenous or whatever. We're constructed in all these kind of settler colonialism as a mechanism, at least for for us in the United States, but also in Israel, what Israel has done to Palestine, those things are for us, not simply a question of critique, 
It's a question of how do we get fucking free? And in the first uprising, the organizing happened, the leadership came from outside. You know, we signed Oslo. Where was 181 in Oslo? 181 wasn't recognized. What was the basis for the negotiations? 242338, right? And that wasn't really, you know, we know what that was. We know the PLO had backed the wrong side. Their funding got cut off from the Gulf. But this is all to say that Palestinian national liberation has always tried to comport itself to the, to the idea of a nation state, at least under the leadership of Fatah. That's not the case under, let's say, pan-Arab movements or whatever, whatever. But it's important for this moment for us to think when we say free Palestine, what do we mean? And what do we say when we say free Palestine from Bay Ridge, what do we mean? And what kind of responsibilities and obligations arise in the context of struggle? Because we, whether you're an academic or an artist or any of these identities that we hold you know, important to us, we're engaged in struggle and we're engaged in how to get free. And we know, and it's not complicated, that we need each other to get free. But we're also right in the in the context that we find ourselves both oppressed and you know oppressor. So this is kind of the framework in the organizing that we've done. We've done direct action from for Palestine. I was you know part of the first uprising, really young. Did you know did the Amnesty International thing? Went to the law stuff. Was at King's College. Lectured on self determination. Wrote a piece on who is the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. There is, come on, during the decolonization era, who was speaking on behalf of who? I mean, that's part of the problem. Who can speak on my behalf? A Palestinian can speak on behalf of another Palestinian, irrespective of their class, irrespective of like all these kind of things. If we're talking about freedom, then we're not just talking about this linearity of freedom, where it's like freedom from the outside and then somehow we make it better on the inside. That's the 20th century. And here we are. So in thinking then about film, right? So now we're shifting and thinking about film. What kind of film do you make about Palestine? If in the 60s you had, you know, activist films or films like that that were thinking, well, there's an there's an ideology that's resisting. We can create pedagogy and aesthetics within that to kind of push the other uh, thinking. We don't have that now, at least not within the framework of nation states, right? Um, we, we have experiments like the Zabatistas that are well known or the Kurds in, you know, Syria, you know, this area, right, Palestinian film uh, that we, we could refer to. But that's, that's when we started thinking about prefigurative politics and then thinking about looking and mapping as a way of seeing in order to orient towards each other where the film can both create a space with each other in order to get free or create spaces, pockets to think together about what does it mean to get free, but also to recognize our own conditions, although in different contexts, similarly felt in ways that we can bond with each other. I would just say um, a few things just, you know, kind of to reference, you know, 1947 is um, also the time when there is a partition happening in India and Pakistan. So, you know, I think that 1947 and 1948 are really important markers in the British empire, because, you know, in the 1930s, they've seen really radical resistance to the occupation and empire, both in South Asia and in Middle East. And what was crazy for me to kind of learn through, because I've been born and raised in India and my father was in the Indian military. So he was in the Indian army and my, my great grandfather and my grandfather, they both fought uh, the wars for the British empire because most of the foot soldiers were Sikhs, you know? Um, and a lot of like, most of the wars, you know, were like Filipino soldiers and that's still there today. Like who actually is the soldiers in UN? It's people from India and Philippines who are like, you know, cheap labor <laughs> to fight wars. So that's, you know, the, that's the kind of context that I was personally coming from when I actually met Amin, also in 2009, so it's really nice to hear you guys met in 2009, and then we start thinking about, you know, what does it mean to be free in the context of the image, but really as a life practice when we have to start thinking about outside the models of the nation state, and I think one of the first things at that time we did was this idea of called, um, what is a refugee if there is no nation state, right, and like, because, you know, we were actually talking to 
um, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and Jordan and, and Egypt who were like, you know, who are they, who've been, you know, dis, uh, displaced from 1947, but also 1967, right? So there's like, and there's a continuous displacement. It's happening now as well. So I think um, it's been it, it's been important to kind of have the conversation in Palestine, which is outside of this model of nation state to actually think about what does planetary freedom mean for us today and how Palestine can be a place of thinking through that, uh, mainly also because of what Israeli technology means in the world right now, especially military surveillance, media, nation state technology that whole world is using. And so now you have these kind of connections which are becoming much more deeper, de deeper right? So there's a connection now between Palestine, Punjab, Kashmir, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, you know, uh, Chile, because what, what the Israeli empire is also connected with the US and Canada, like all the mining that Canada is doing. So you can see that all these, you know, as, as, as um, um, you know, you were mentioning about that these Western nations are the ones who did the UN. So you actually can see the whole thing kind of play out. And so in that way, then we are thinking about what is a decolonial project, right? When 1955 conference that happened where all these different nations who were kind of getting free of their colonizers, be it French or British, uh, trying to think about what can the future look like, and that was very for, uh, that was foreclosed quickly. And very and 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 now, if you look at any nation state, you have to be uh, you know capitalist for sure, but also settler colonial. I mean, India is a settler colonial nation state at this point. Uh, you know the way it's functioning in places like Punjab and Kashmir, and all that technology is getting exported from Israel. But also, Israel has learned that from the British Empire, like the idea of collective punishment. That Israelis use on Palestinians today. And so when oppressor, so like what does organizing mean, but also what does freedom mean? And then what does what is the role of aesthetics within that? Um, and so I think that you know we, we're gonna show the film, but also um after the film, I think we just want to show a few slides of um Strike MoMA, which is basically the organizing part of things, right? Um so Strike MoMA has been just this, you know, actions that happened outside of MoMA for 10 weeks. And they were uh, on the idea of this idea of the interconnected struggle and the idea of globalizing the intifada. Uh, because, you know, like for example, institutions like MoMA, you can see like any art institution at this point, they have an interlocking directorate, right? A, a bunch of board members who are connected with each other. You know, so in, on the board of MoMA, you have Luan Black, you know, who's of course a sexual harasser. Then you have BlackRock, which was burned, you know, responsible for burning the Amazon. You have folks who are connected to the NYPD and funders of the NYPD. You have folks who are defining definitions of anti-Semitism right now in universities that allow for Palestinian organizing to be completely sidelined. You know, those are the board members of MoMA. You have somebody called as General Dynamics who does surveillance in South America, but also throws missiles in Yemen and is also part of like oppression in Gaza. So this is the art world, right? And so then we as artists, like what does inter you know, kind of internet connected struggle look like? Um, so this is just the context for the images that you're gonna see and then we'll just go through them and we're done. And, and it's beautiful because like listening to what was said in the speech and, and the conversations around 181, which was so abstract and so far away. And I think the, the, the film is very close. Uh, to Palestine in that way, so it's a good one. Leila, could you start the film? Yes, I'll go ahead and share. Oh, and then this is the, this is the be we should say something about it. So we're going to watch just ten minutes. It's the first ten minutes. Uh, the film uh, is likely to get done this year, but we've been working on it for years. It hasn't received any funding from any foundation. Part of the way we raise funds for the film is we've taken people like David Graeber, Andrew Ross, Jasmir Puar, who wanted to do research, and we acted as like uh, guides for them. And, and filming where we would go with them and also evening conversations that then would inform the lens and where we went the next day, so. Also just to share that the sound is raw right now. It's a very raw situation, but we just wanted to share. So. You might have to increase the volume all the way up, Lela, just in case.
just do the slides. Yeah, um, Lila, if we could just have the slides now, just to kind of transition into the slides, I think in terms of the film, what we've been thinking about, you know, what is the project of the nation state, but also the what is the project of modernity? And I think in the film, that's what, something that we've been thinking about because modernity is also <clears throat> thinking about settler colonization and colonization, right? The promise of modernity has been that, oh, it's not colonial, but actually it's extremely connected to the settler colonial state and also, you know, the nation state. And like, for example, 1947 and 48 is also the founding of the Indian modern state, right? And that's the promise that Palestine didn't get, which many of the other kind of decolonial countries did get, but we all got it with our own partitions and our own borders. Actually the same person drew the borders in Palestine is the same general British general who drew it in, 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 in India and Pakistan. So you're seeing this kind of like lines being drawn with this idea of divide and rule, right? Which is what the British uh, terminology was at that time to kind of still have power over different nation states and be able to build a world that's post-colonial and modern. So it was one again, you know, once again, that chicken. So I think in the film, uh, you know, and through the research that Amin was talking about with people going uh, with us to Palestine to thinking about is like, who builds the nation state of Israel, right? Um, and so with the, with the um, Andrew Ross, who's, you know, written the book, Who Builds the Nation State of Israel, he's talking about the workers who build the wall themselves. And that's what you see is like some of the Tel Aviv, times, and, more. Tel Aviv and more. And so you see like, you know, scenes from the checkpoint, for example, as this modern ship that is building this state, right? Whereas what land is getting extracted and you see the Dead Sea and you see what, what has happened right now. There's so many sinkholes in the Dead Sea. It's like, a, like so the, the, the kind of project of settler coloniality in itself is such an extractive project. And we can see that even with, you know, people planning to go to Mars and the moon. And like, I mean, it's, an, it, it, it's just like inherently violent to just life, you know? Um, and so I think that uh, just to kind of quickly go through the slides, because I think we have just five minutes, exactly. is this just to pivot to organizing and how we think about it in terms of organizing. So this is a manual, uh, you know, decolonial operations manual. I can drop it in the chat. It, we, we kind of came up with this manual after organizing uh, for five years. And here's a map, yeah, that you can see of the different sites uh, that we've thought through as sites of injustices that we could map with our bodies or like actually think about doing actions. So for example, places like the American Museum of Natural History or the Whitney or MoMA or, uh, you know, uh, the police precinct or the Ford Foundation um, or Central Park, you know, so these are all different kind of uh, projects of na uh, settler national, uh, sorry, settler coloniality that works within nation states. And then how do we break them? How do we create these, you know, pockets of time and space that are outside of that colonial logic? And so the answer for us has been like kind of building these relations that are thinking about a decolonial world or an abolitionist world. And, and so where we enact the futures as we're doing the action and like not li living in this kind of linear timeline of modernity, right? Which says that progress was from the past and development is in the future because that's what is eating my village, for example, you know, uh, in Punjab. And so how do we actually create this kind of decolonial world and an abolitionist world today in amongst us? Um, do you wanna? Um, so from a lot of this work is many groups and many people um, over a course of time. But one of, the, one of the things that we learned from previous organizing is that even if your actions are effective, how, they need to be with a shared politics. So the shared politics has to underlie an action that may seem the same in its moment. And I think what we did for the first time is put a framework for terms of struggle where people can identify, no, this is really decolonization. This is really not that you're against a museum or against an institution. And we know that institutions are just the state. It's where our lives interact with the state. They happen at the institution, whether it's the hospital, the, you know, the precinct or the, so in thinking about that, we were thinking, obviously, institutions are also not monolithic and we're engaged in struggle. So the idea of like action, it's not about who's inside and outside. It's about making these borders and walls and barriers more porous. That changes the terms of the engagement. And that's what actually works against counterinsurgency, right? And that's why they're always trying to discipline labor. And that's why they're, you know, the, the professor is always trying to discipline the student, right? So there's this a whole kind of dynamic. So we just put this out there and then we launched 10 weeks of action. 
But what we were also pointing out is like, these are the interconnected struggles that for us to get free require for, uh, for us to hold space. Um, next, you could just keep going next. Yeah, really quick. Yeah, this is just, you know, uh, at the post MoMA Future Plaza, which was right next to uh, MoMA. So actually just thinking about diversity of strategies and aesthetics, so poetry, dance, taking up space, pedagogy, which you guys mentioned, uh, eating, you know, these all these kind of acts kind of become this project of thinking together, right? And actually enacting the futures that we want now. Um, we can keep just showing these slides. And, uh, you know, the idea of the ruins is something that we've been also thinking about, right? The ruins of modernity tour. So it was really nice to see that in your exhibition. And like, you know, what does dancing on the rubbles actually mean, right? So the question of, do, do we need the museum? You know, like, and I think it's a important question that we are thinking about in relation to institutions today, especially thinking about abolition and the conversation that's happening around police. And, you know, uh, people like Fred Morin and Ruthie Gilmour have said, right? Abolition is a practice of making things present, but it's also like, for example, this idea that it's not that you just need to defund the police, it's that we actually don't need a society that requires prison, right? So how does that actually happen in social movement world? Because the social movement world is also like, you know, this open wound of our society. So all the kind of oppressions that we see that come from colonialism and statehood and the traumas that come from it are part of the social movement world. So this idea of, and in, they're in our household too. And these are questions around, you know, how do we talk about Palestine example in, in, in Punjab, for example. So these are just, you know, some images of how we've been trying to connect Palestine through other struggles and how like, you know, this is also like, for example, at MoMA, you know, there was an action that happened around Palestine uh, with the group within our lifetime, which comes from Bay Ridge, which is a predominantly Palestinian community in New York. And they've been part of other actions also like, you know, direct action fund for Palestine. How do those organizers, for example, talk to organizers from Dominican Republic, right? Where also mining is happening. And the board members of both these people, you know, the people who are enacting this violence sit on the board of MoMA. So how do people kind of come together, right? In this organizing, and then how do we actually think about these institutions as also places and sites of struggle, uh, be it universities, uh, public parks, museums, and that all of these institutions also under them have this idea of the land, right? The central question again is the land. And then it's a, it's a question of the land in relation to private property um, or even resources as we are thinking about today. So, you know, this idea of until all our lands are free. Um, yeah, because the conversation around police is also a conversation around property and a conversation around, you know, you know, capitalism. And I think that people right now we're at this juncture where we, you know, what we were talking about, it's like, we don't have a choice. We have to think through it. Um, just the last slide, which I think you can talk about and then which we can, it's coming. Uh, the next one. No. Oh, it might have not might downloaded. Have not made it. So just it's end okay. on, on, on Yeah, on, but I can end it, we can end it on globalize the intifada that, uh, that slide. On the right hand side, it's that, you know, like for example, this idea of that Palestine is not just in Palestine, Palestine is also in Punjab. So this idea of de-exceptionalizing Palestine, for example, um, in last year, you know, for a year almost, farmers in Punjab and other, you know, uh, close by states had been shutting the border in Delhi against privatization of laws around agriculture and trying to think about, you know, land as something that still belongs. But the problem is that, you know, we are still le living the legacies of the British statehood, you know, like places like Palestine, in India, Egypt, all the post colonial states, they're actually British, you know, empires in some ways. And so I think. This, this idea of what does it mean to free our land today or what does it to mean to be even think of freedom makes us ask the question of like, how are we moving away from this idea of nation state? How are we incorporating the idea that modernity and as you already said, technology, colonialism, capitalism, these are all harmful to our lives. And how can we then, you know, think of like, you know, this idea that law is not justice, it's just one space, right? And how do we de-assimilate them? And I think that's what we're thinking about is like, what is the project of de-assimilation today so that we can build these worlds? Thank you so much, Natasha and Amin. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? I will pass it over to Stephen Corey then. Okay, thank you. Um, I. There's a lot that has been covered here in a short period of time. And um, I, I, I found it very um, thought-provoking, everyone's presentations. 
And I guess uh, what I'd like to do, I have some questions for each of the panelists. And I think I'll go through the questions that I have for each of the panelists and then the, the panelists can respond to those questions. If anybody in the audience would also like to ask some questions, there is, I believe, a Q&A function there. Is that true, Layla, that they can, they can uh, put a question in? Yes, that's right. And you'll be able to see them. So um, while, we're, while we're doing this portion where I'm, I'm putting forth my questions, maybe if any in the audience have questions that they would like any of the panelists to uh, respond to, you can go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. And then after uh, we finish with this part, we'll have, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, I guess, for, uh, for Q&A from the audience. And uh, we, can, we can deal with those questions as well. So um, I'll get on with, with uh, my questions. Um, first of all, for uh, Hong An and uh, Huang, um, I really uh, found your your uh, your show striking, very very impressive. And I'm sorry that there is noise in the background. I'm going to close my door. <laughs> sorry about that. That's the problem with doing these things at home. Um, okay, so um, a couple of questions that struck me that I would be interested in you talking a little bit more about. One was you mentioned the, um, the combining what you talked about with the speeches from, on uh, Resolution 181 with, um, with uh, a fictional uh, a movie, a film based on the 1939 World's Fair. And uh, I was interested uh, Maybe you could talk a little more about that, um, uh, how that tied in. I know you said it was from the same space um, and talked a little bit about it, but I would really be interested in hearing a little more about the, the connections uh, there. Um, I thought the speeches were, uh, I mean, your use of the speeches was really interesting. And um, I was interested in if you organized them, when you put them on the wall, did you organize them in a particular way? Um, were you, uh, how how you were uh, uh, thinking about um, uh, how uh, those would impact the the people that, that come through, and um, I also thought the oral history project, uh, interacting with people from the community um, in the Cleveland area, was was a great uh, idea. And I would be interested if you have any feedback from that, what you learned from that whole experience. Um, then moving on to uh, Dr. Quigley, um, really uh, found uh, your presentation fascinating. Uh, so many points I would love to talk about, but I, I know we have limited time. Um, I thought it was interesting that here we are at the, the Cold War really uh, starting to become the dominant uh, issue in the world in the aftermath of World War II. And you have a situation where both the Soviet Union and the United States come down on the same side um, in supporting this resolution on uh, Palestine. I thought that was very interesting. I thought um, what you had to say about how they came uh, around to that position was, was also very interesting. I was wondering in terms of the Soviet Union, um, you mentioned Stalin's goals and trying to undermine Britain's uh, influence in the area. And I was wondering, um, if there was any element, uh, if there was any connection also to the fact that so many of the Zionists uh, had come from Russia and from Eastern Europe, and also that, that there were uh, Zionist leaders that were uh, socialists, including Ben-Gurion and other influential Zionist leaders. And I was wondering if that had any connection as well with uh, the reasons why the Soviet Union decided to support um, the establishment of Israel. And, and not only uh, did they support it on May 15th, uh, 1948, but they also funneled weapons to uh, the Zionists uh, in 1948 through, through Czechoslovakia, um, which helped them to, to win the, the war. So I was wondering if, if you have any thoughts about that connection. Um, I would also though, you talked about, and I think you made a very good point in emphasizing 
that there was a lot of history that went into the buildup to where we reached this point in um, uh, November of 1947, where the UN is called on to make this decision. And, um, you know, uh, the Zionist movement had been going by this point for uh, about uh, 60 years or so. Um, there had been a lot of Jewish immigration into Palestine. There had been the Balfour Declaration. There had been the, uh, the, the British mandate in Palestine. And as you mentioned, this whole problem was uh, thrown on the UN shortly after it had been created um, and they were supposed to solve it. And I'm wondering, um, is, there, is there any way it could have gone differently? It, it kind of seems like, uh, as you, you point out, how none of, the, none of the delegates really thought this was a great idea, but they couldn't think of anything better. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, was this a foregone conclusion? Or could you have seen it go in a, in a different direction somehow? And if so, what direction would that have been? Um, and then finally, I, I was struck by how, um, how the United States has been uh, really tied in with this conflict since the very beginning, um, as you pointed out with Truman and, and, and uh, what we did uh, uh, for the pressure we put on the UN delegates to support this resolution. And I was wondering, um, beyond you know Truman needing to get elected and and those sorts of things, the U.S. has pretty consistently been uh, extremely one-sided in this conflict uh, almost the entire time, with very few periods where that's not the case. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, why uh, the U.S. is so one-sided in the conflict, and why the Arabs. Um, I could not have really, I mean, uh, they had seemingly some things on their side. They were the majority in the, in the, in the, in the region as, as late as 1947, um, why they weren't able to stop this. I know that's a lot of questions. So just address whichever one you, you think are, are, are best. And then on uh, uh, Mina and Natasha, I was really, um, struck by your film. I found it interesting. Uh, I know it was just the first 10 minutes and I would love to hear more about what you plan to do with that film, um, uh, how you plan to develop it, what you, uh, what you would like to, uh, how you, what kind of impact you envision it having. Um, and I also thought the, um, the questions you raised about what is, uh, you know, how can freedom really be obtained? Um, and and the problems with the nation state and the connections between um, modernity, colonialism, and capitalism. And especially, Natasha, you brought up those comparisons with India and Pakistan, um, and even to the point where it was, a, it was the partition of India was happening at the same time as what was going on in, um, in Palestine and uh, the comparisons there. So um, I, was, I would love to hear more about your thoughts about, as you talk about a decolonized world um, and um, how you would answer the question in terms of um, the question that you raised about uh, what is, is uh, freedom um, and how can it be obtained. So um, those are the thoughts I had. So I don't know, maybe we could start with, um, with the artists if you could uh, respond and then we'll go to Dr. Quigley and then um, Amina and Natasha. Thank you for those questions, Dr. Corey. Um, hang on, do you want to start first or should I start? I just remember the first one, so maybe hopefully you remember the other two, but I'll just briefly um, address, yeah, and you can you can um, chime in, Hung, but I think the first question was about just sort of our intentions of bringing these two, the one historical events of the UN um, speeches uh, and arguments for and against 181, and then the film, the fictional film from the World's Fair. So part of it is that, you know, our, our kind of juxt, you know, kind of cramming these two moments together, one obviously very historical, one fictional, was to really make a very direct connection between the imperatives of colonialism that's bound up with capital and thinking about labor. So the film itself is just a, an almost humorous and kind of ridiculous 
um, kind of caricature of sort of all of what we can understand is sort of like these critiques of capitalism. So there's, you know, in the film, there's this main character who's um, kind of pro-capitalist. And then there's a, there's a communist kind of, uh, agitator in the film who's the boyfriend of the of the daughter um, in the in the Middleton's family so to us it just really clearly set out already the kind of like political conflicts in the kind of ideological uh kind of battle that was playing out and clearly in this very propagandistic way um that reached you know obviously a huge audience with the world's fair so it seemed to us to be this really clear um connection that seemed, you know, even as one was fictional and one was very historical, that these these ideological strains were were part of the same kind of uh, uh, same kind of uh, in, sort of political goals. Yeah, and just to give a little bit of um, a kind of plot brief of that the Middletons, um, it is because I know we don't feature it, you know, we didn't screen it and we don't feature it that much in the um, installation. Um, it is a family that goes to the World's Fair and um, the, the it's set up so that um, you're kind of, um, the father of the family is trying to convince his son that um, the future is bright because of uh, industrialization and capitalism. And um, the daughter has to kind of make a decision between her communist um, boyfriend, who is also her art teacher, and <laughs> um, the the um, the her kind of hometown boyfriend who is working for the fair and is like a kind of you know a proponent of um, industrialization. Um, so you see this kind of, you know, as Hong An is saying, you see this visualization of these decisions that, you know, we're, we're kind of faced with as a nation. Um, so the second question, I hope that answers your question, uh, Dr. Corey. The second question was about the prints and how we made the decision of hanging them. Um, you know, we started with eye level kind of thinking like, you know, which ones do we want to make sure that people are seeing um, when they first approach this installation? So we made sure to hang those. And then from that, we were kind of, um, you know, just um, it was more visual after that of making sure that there was a nice pacing of the different um, uh, pieces and how there was just a nice kind of rhythm and balance of, of the different pieces. Um, but, um, and this is kind of getting into my own questions, if I, if I can pile some on, but, um, you know, one thing reading those speeches, um, you, Dr. Corey, you were asking, like, what were the other options that could have happened? And it was really, for me, we, well, both Hong An and I have kept wondering, like, what happened with the Philippines? Their speech was so strongly against um, the partition, and yet they voted for it. You know, so we were always kind of curious, like, was that political or economic pressuring from the United States? Um, I also was really interested in how there was a kind of a last ditch effort by the delegate from France um, who was advocating for just like, a, a, you know, trying to come up with a, you know, a, an, another option. Um, but it was given the time frame of one day, you know, of coming up with <laughs> like a, you know, a solution. So, you know, I felt like there was that posturing that was happening, you know, sometimes it, it seemed very genuine and other times it seemed like, you know, maybe they were posturing, but would, would, were not interested in expending some of that political capital um, towards, towards the actual vote. Um, but um, yeah, I'm going to pause there. I have another question for Amina and Natasha, but I'll ask them later. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Quigley, can, do you have anything you can say? Uh, you're muted, Dr. Quigley. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I hope anyone listening will uh, you know, do, do some research. Uh, these are questions that I've thought about for quite some time, and, and I don't have really good answers to them. I mean, it is very curious that you had the Soviet Union and the United States 
taking similar positions. They don't seem to have coordinated their positions, interestingly. It seems it was more parallel action than it was coordinated action on their part. Uh, and in both cases, the decision to take the approach they did came up at the very last minute. Um, but why they did, uh, you know, uh, you, you raise the fact that many of the, uh, the, the Zionists were Russians and, and, and that's true. And that very well may have been a factor um, uh, that, that, that they could talk very, you know, easily with one another. Uh, they had the same background um, uh, and that there was a strain of socialism in, in the, the Zionist movement. Um, uh, and that was played on very strongly, in fact, by the Jewish agency as they were lobbying the, uh, the Soviets uh, during the, the war. Um, they made connections in particular at the uh, Soviet embassy in London where there was a fellow there who, who was very uh, uh, happy to talk with the Zionists. Uh, and they told him, they, you know, they said, you know, you uh, have your collective farms. Well, we have kibbutzim. Uh, so we're, you know, all on the same page here. Um, and they invited some of the Soviet diplomats to visit Palestine in 1943, in 1944. Um, to, to visit some of, of these kibbutzim, um, uh, and, and that, that was done. Uh, but the, the Soviets were very strong, as you say. They, they, they arranged for Czechoslovakia to, to supply arms to the, to the Haganah, the, to the, the military force of the, uh, of the Jewish agency. Um, uh, and so that was, was key. Um, for the United States, I know the, the uh, Secretary of Defense was a man named James Forrestal, and he was very strongly against the idea that the United States should support the, uh, the Jewish statehood in Palestine. I mean, he said, you know, we need to be on the side of the Arab countries. Uh, they're the ones that have the oil. Uh, if you're just thinking about the self-interests of the United States, uh, we should be on their side, not on the side of, of the Zionists. Um, but he was marginalized by Truman uh, uh, in, in the course of all of these uh, discussions. Um, uh, as to what happened at the, at the UN, um, uh, you know, Trigva Lee was the secretary general and he was of the view that the UN was moving in the direction of Jewish statehood, supporting Jewish statehood, uh, and that it would be a great defeat for the UN as an institution if it didn't go ahead in that direction. That is, if it made it look as if it was uh, you know, going in the wrong direction. So he, he, his view, I think, was based largely on what he saw as the institutional uh, imperatives of the, the, the new organization. Um, but whether it could have gone in another, another direction, that's a fascinating uh, question. Um, uh, it may well be that none of what was done at the UN made any difference at all. Uh, it could have been that the Haganah would, would take over the country <laughs> regardless, because the British had, had weakened the Arabs of Palestine so much that, that even if they had gotten the UN to say, yes, there should be an independent Palestine, the way the, the uh, Arab state delegates were advocating. Even if that had happened, um, I think it's still quite possible that the uh, Jewish agency would have, have run most of the Arabs out of the country. They, they wouldn't have had the aura of, of doing it legally, but, but Ben-Gurion really didn't care very much about the appearances. Um, he, he was was a very practical politician, uh, and and I I rather think that he would have gone ahead and done exactly the same thing. Great, thank you. I, 
what you said also made me think of uh, going back to the King Crane Commission uh, after um, World War I, how um, Americans sent this, this commission to, uh, to the region to get the views of the people as to what kind of government they wanted because it was supposed to be you know, self-determination and how the King Crane Commission was very much against, um, very critical of the whole Zionist project. Um, and yet, as you point out, you do have these different uh, instances where you have Americans uh, that express, uh, you know, strong criticism of the project, and yet it's it's just kind of shunted aside. It's never it never really derails our our um, pretty much consistent uh, support of the whole um, of the whole Zionist uh, state. So very, very good, very interesting thoughts. Um, Natasha and Amin, do you have any, any thoughts? So I'll, I'll just say a few words about the film and then Natasha can pick up the other question. Um, you know, about the film, I think it started with just me and Natasha wanting to make a film and, um, and wanting to make a film about Palestine. And the more we thought about it and we looked at images and looked at films, and we haven't been seeing films we want to see about Palestine. And what does that look like? I mean, that's really all it is. I'm tired of the pain. I'm tired of the documentary genre. I'm tired of the underlying assumption that if people just see it, their behavior will change, as if it's not like material conditions that also drive people. And so, so it was like in the, in the practice of making the film, it was really kind of about taking our friends to Palestine and and you know, and, and thinking about these elemental questions from the beginning, like I was taught not to use a tripod, right? Because a tripod is a position of privilege, but a tripod could also be an act of resistance, you know, releasing the camera for a long duration and then meditating on the footage and trying to see and trying to learn how to see and trying to see differently. Because a lot of what Israel does in its cartography of occupation and it's very similar to other projects, you know, you stay on one line and you don't look up. And if you look up, you won't see except settlements and you can't be up there unless you have money and you're, you know, you're uh, in Nablus, what's his name? The Muslim, who was also participating in the negotiations, who also encouraged Arafat to go into Oslo. You know what I mean? And also so, runs all the communication systems in Palestine now. You know, and I think, and I think that, you know, so, I, so I think, so, so our film, you say, what is it? Our film is around 70 minutes. So this is a full feature, right? Um, and it's, you know, after the first 20 minutes, all of a sudden you end up in areas like Rawabi and where Arafat is buried, because there's the nation state for you. What is that doing? I mean, we we made a mockery out of the whole thing. Ramadi actually, is basically a gated community, or like a, a, a basically yeah, a, where settlers a, are buying houses too. I mean, you know, like, this is what we're talking about right now, and, and and it's it's just their project is both failing, but it's it's insidious. And I think that the idea of rearrangement of desire, the idea of training in the practice of freedom, the idea it takes a while. And that the engagement and struggle is one that, that in the process we figure things out. And this is also, I, the academia has been talking about that, like Mamdani's last book, Neither Native Nor Settler, because it's about the political imaginary. There is no return, right, in that, in that, in that rudimentary way. There, no one wants to go back anywhere, but we want to belong and we want to breathe and we want to thrive and we want to actually determine our own fucking destiny. But it means not give us a government and say, here, they're determining your destiny. Good for you. So these, these are old questions. And I think all of us together are thinking them again. And the film tries to do that. But the film <laughs> is also thinking, OK, you can look at the settler colonization, but let's look at it infrastructurally. You don't need to see a soldier to know who's killing you. That's the obvious one. The person with a bullet, that's obvious. But what are the ways in which our behavior gets conformed such that we are the violence? And I don't mean violence on each other. I mean that we consent to it and we actually reproduce it as we say we are resisting. Which, you know, and I think, so then the act two is looking at Palestine and in the crevices because, 
it's not about the funeral of a martyr. It's about the gathering and who they take from you, right? And it's and so who you who you who you're being present with and how the camera is behaving becomes part of it. So I think we were just on this journey, on this journey with friends, but we were also trying to think if Qatar won't fund this shit, if Al Jazeera won't play it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now they say, oh well, we'll have a some you know looking into Shireen's death. Oh yeah, great. We needed one more thing, just like they did for any number of people. But you know, looking at the Palestinian context is important because getting free in a way by then people who look like you controlling you, isn't it? I mean, we can't hide who killed Basil Araj. We can't hide who's giving Palestinian freedom fighters up. You can't hide Jawal and all the joint ventures that are with Israelis because filthy rich people they don't care about their nationalities. They're operating on another level, you know? And I think that our films, you know, there's, we make all sorts of films. We just wanted a film that actually is about fucking revolution in a way that isn't about the revolutions of the 20th century. And I think, so that's the, tra that's the trajectory of that. But what's holding this film together is really two martyr scenes. That are that are that it will show up, right? All of this is just context to experience Palestine in a different way, on different terms. I think it's mainly like around the reorientation, right? I think it's like you know, um, you ask the question of what is freedom and how, like you know, the relationship of modernity and nation state and all of that. I think like you know, if you understand how the project of postcolonialism or modernity in in itself inherently and the project of nation state is also a colonial project, then I think the question on what is freedom becomes a big question because there's a lot of unlearning that we have to do, right? We are raised as subjects who are like, you know, either you're a citizen of a country or you are a member of a certain community that is, you know, it's happening even like, you know, like you're asking the relationship between Punjab and Palestine, right? It's actually like Palestine has taught me to see Punjab in a way that makes it very clear for me, right? Because you can be in the context and the waters can be very muddied, right? Right now, like for example, on the ground, like in the villages, the movement in Punjab is going back to, you know, the separationist movement, right? There's that, there's one faction who wants to separate from the nation state of India. And then there's the other who wants to assimilate with the nation state of India. And then there's the neoliberal project of getting all the water because, you know, it's a land of five rivers. So there's water for wars going on between Pakistan and India. So like climate change, all of this stuff, I mean, the geopolitics is so inherently you know, just destroyed at this point, but also like, you know, inheritance of colonial structures around these borders that we're talking about. Like Punjab was, is, is a partition between Pakistan and India, right? And so <clears throat> in terms of that, I think what happens with is like, when you understand Palestine and you have solidarity for Palestine, you actually start to see how Palestine is also in your homes and how those technologies are getting imported right now. And also you start, you know, kind of connecting like it, like, you know, like a lot of my family members were part of the Indian National Freedom Movement, but we never heard of Palestine in the same way because that's also a tool of the emperor to empire to categorize, right? And this is what you go and see when you go to something like the American Museum of Natural History. They have sliced up the world and told you how to look at it. You go to the British Museum, it's the same project. They, you go to the Room of Enlightenment in the British Museum, you see how they've divvied up the whole world and how they look at Asian peoples and how they look at African peoples. And so like the pedagogically that's inherently given even in us, right? Fanon talks about it in his book, uh, what is it called? Uh, Black Skin, White Mask, right? Even the logic of who a human is, we have internalized that, that a, civ a civilized modern human is the only way to develop and be modern. So the, the irony and the heartbreak happens when like, you know, movements become decolonial, are, have that decolonial potential, are, you know, when the ruptures happen, but then they get taken through counterinsurgency or NGOs back into the state and the assimilation project. And I think that's also something that happened in Punjab where there was, you know, for a year, people have been fighting against privatization of laws, you know, uh, laws which would lead to privatization of land. But at the same time, you know, and it's a very radical fight because, you know, it's also a fight within a fascist Hindu state and was led by a minority Sikhs, but also Muslim solidarity, you know, because it's an Islamophobic state, which is, you know, under Narendra Modi. 
But the irony of it is the same, which is in Palestine, right? The future of Punjab as this thought is like, oh, we, we want development and development is the key to freedom. And I think that's the unlearning that we are talking about, the which Mayan also, and, and the, the Mayan, Mayan chain is the, the same thing. progress and development. I worked, I worked for, um, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Husseini, uh, Hiba Husseini. And she was working, she was a senior, she was, a, she was an advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team. And I was, you know, I was also close to Diana Butu, who was working on this stuff at, at the same time. And it's just like the conditions. And, and I had a professor in law school that helped draft from Indiana University for the World Bank, helped draft the investment code for the Palestinians, for the Palestinian Authority. Dude, script, script, neoliberal script. None of it we had a say in, none of it. So you get to see a post-colonial condition emerge now. And what are the terms for it? And look what it has led to. What this is, isn't a failed negotiations. You can listen to 38 by um, the poem 38 by, um, what's her name? Again, the story of what happened to, to indigenous people in Min what we know as Minnesota right now. Same, treaty abrogated. More treaty abrogated. You, you resist. Oh, you, you, you don't have money to pay your credit? We take away your land. Oh, you have to sell your labor? Oh, well, your labor will, will be directed over here. To do what? To ruin your spirit. And that's what they do to Palestinians. So all of a sudden, the Palestinians build the wall, the settlements, pay for their imprisonment. We, Palestinians, pay for Israel to imprison Palestinians. You don't get around this with logic. You get around this with a refusal of all of this fucking bullshit. And that's, that's the thing with, with what's happening right now. It's like, they're so obvious about it. They don't need, right? You don't like Trump? We'll give you an 80 year old person who actually loves war, doesn't give a fuck about what's gonna happen, good to go. You don't like voting for him? What do you want? So if the Supreme Court is foreclosed, obvious. If the Congress is bought and sold, we made sure that's legal. If your president gets selected and it's two sides to the same coin, which is similar to what you have with the Likud or the whatever, you know, in, in a larger project, and you're still serious about like, this is really hurting me and hurting the people I love, then, then you have to sit with it and it's like, well, what's effective? But just that question, asking it without knowing the answer to it is everything. And I think that's what that film tries to do, you know? Great, thank you. Um, I, I, ju I just went to a, um, a, a Zoom conference uh, on the one state solution. It was uh, put on by, well, it was both uh, Jews and, and Arabs. But one of the points that they made was the whole two state solution idea was kind of like this false dream that was dangled before the Palestinians as they were in the process of basically losing all of their all of their land. So I, I thought it was a really interesting point. Well, we only have a few minutes left. Um, nobody has submitted anything in Q and A, but I, I was wondering if any of the panelists. And I know I think Huang, you said you had a question for uh, Natasha and Amin. If any yeah. of the other panelists had any questions they wanted to ask. Um, uh, Natasha, I mean, thank you so much for sharing uh, the part of your film. I'm, I'm so excited about it. I was just, uh, it was just breathtaking. Um, and I was struck by how different it is from your organizing work, which, you know, just kind of looking through some of those materials, um, it's really about clarity, really about parsing things out and, and um, you know, and, and making it uh, the issue as legible as possible. And I felt in that film a refusal in a way, you know, and, and um, I, but I'm, I, and how, you know, I was just struck by how you were uh, making us look and making us really pay attention through, through the visuals and the sound and, and pay attention to the details and, 
uh, position ourselves relative to the details. But I can just imagine knowing how much you two are able to talk about a subject and are so articulate about it. What a struggle that must have been to come to that. <laughs> to that approach. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. And if you wanted to talk about any of your collaborative process, you know, like Hongan and I are so excited about like having other collaborators here. You know, um, this is also related to this idea of, you know, training in the practice of freedom that Gayatri Spivak talks about that we actually don't know how to be free. So in the same way, we actually don't know how to make a film that actually talks about <laughs> freedom of Palestine. And that has been kind of the training, right? And like, I think, you know, when we met in, in, in ICP, we started thinking about the image, we were thinking about war because, you know, we both have experienced that. Like I mentioned, my father was in the Indian army, so he was posted in Kashmir and I was like, seven years old when, you know, he was posted on the border with Pakistan. My, my own house is 26 kilometers away from the border with Pakistan and my grandmother's on the other side. So borders and occupation and war and military, it's something that we live with, it's our histories as, as is part of yours, you also know this, right? And so we started thinking about what's a freed image. <laughs> and so in order to be able to do that, what we did was like kind of, our first trip to Palestine was in 2010 together. I mean, of course, Amin has, you know, been raised and lived there, but my first trip was in 2010 and it went, it was from the understanding of looking at Palestine in terms of how can you see Palestine. And the first thing you actually see is the architecture of the Israeli occupation and how it operates, you know, visually as well. Like, you know, for example, settlements are on, 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 um, on, on hills, how the roads are divided, how IDs are segregated, how land is constantly taken, the difference between cities, villages, area A, B, C, all these kind of constant categorizations that further kind of render a geography inaccessible and, you know, for people. So there might be something that you actually technically need just five minutes to go, but it takes you an hour to get there. So this idea of time is totally like a mindfuck in Palestine, right? And like, especially for Palestinians who have been in, you know, in, in Palestine the whole time, including <laughs> refugee camps. Time has in some ways stopped, right? In front of the TV is whether we can return or not. And so then when, you know, so then we start thinking about all of these things and this was almost like, you know, and, and simultaneously we're having a lot of conversations around what does freedom of Palestine mean in the history of resistance in Palestine. The first intifada, the second intifada, the impact even of, before, like even that. before, but also the impact of the Arab uprisings on Palestine. And you know how that, you know, the, because in, in, in Egypt, you actually did have a, that again, that revolutionary potential that was seized by military power and fascism, right? And you're seeing that, you know, and Egypt is also something that allies with Israel. And so you're seeing all of these kind of movements happen on the ground and you know and 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 then again like so going to your point we, we we nerd out crazily because we also want to organize and we do that in new york then you know when we're organizing but when it came towards the film i think the reason why the film is like that is because that's how we we feel palestine and that that's how we see palestine and i think that the film is way more personal and it's about life you know uh, than than even the organizing in that way where the, the, the strategy with the organizing it is this, it has to be direct and we have to come together and we have to make these links so that we can see each other. And I think in the end, it's all about how do we see each other? How do we hear each other? How do we actually enact our presence with each other? How do we live? How do we feel free? You know, how do we not assimilate? And I think the film, what it does is then for us, like, or what we're trying for it to do is at least give people another, time and space for Palestine. Like it's not about representing Palestine in any way. It's just a time and space that we are trying to kind of craft together based on how we've been uh, in Palestine and in also in the movement world. So, I mean, in some ways, you know, we have act one and act two. So act one is like, you know, our own way of, and we only did this so that we organize in some way the, the kind of uh, idea of the film because it's such a linear tool, but we're not linear people. So in some ways we're also thinking of it as a non-linear film where like, the first, the end, the beginning kind of also is the ending, you know, and in the ending is the beginning. So, um, but we have these three acts and act one basically is just this, this, this cartography of the occupation, looking at the project of modernity, nation state, land extraction, uh, capitalism, neoliberalism, patriarchy, how these things get constructed in history, 
resources. You know, there's a part where there you have the query where you know stone is extracted every time. So it's this you know it's a, it's a planetary question at this point. And then the reorientation comes to like, okay, what do we do now? And I think that's something that we're thinking about as well. We tried to write a lot of texts. And uh, the more we wrote, the more we realized, A, it's already been said, and B, it's not necessary. There's a different project going on. So that was important. And I think also, you know, a lot of the camera work is Natasha and a lot of us thinking about framing and, and what to look at and how to stitch together because we, we can create something different. And so we really want, we believe in, in the potential of the image in this moment, but it, we have to figure out a different language for it. And also, you know, the film, to us, the film isn't the screen and what's on it. It's that space, the act, the materiality of the film is just one thing that allows for- Like your project, back. the pedagogy is important, yeah. right? So I think also answering the question of where the film goes, it goes as a pedagogical project as well. Yeah. And so like, you know, like, like you have in your exhibition, there are zines, there's text, like yeah. there's other, like, you know, like materials. We have a whole uh, magazine called Anemones, which is thinking about Palestine, black liberation and indigenous struggle, the connections between them, that comes out of working on the film. On the film. So the film, the working on the film has resulted in organizing, creating relations with other people who have then, you know, come up with research projects in Palestine. Oh, yeah. David, um, David put out, well, so Jaspir put out a beautiful article. Uh, David put out a beautiful article and Andrew's David book. Graber. Yeah, David Graeber, and then uh, who passed recently. And then Andrew Ross put out that book. But what was interesting about Andrew Ross's book is that the focus on stone and to understand settler colonialism because they brought in cement and it was, around, it was around aesthetics, right? So how they would be the pioneers of that. But then, you know, they still needed the labor. So anyway, even, even the nostalgia of like the Palestinian struggle is something that we were trying to combat in the film. Or, you know, because you'd go to what are the icons? It'd be like, you know, an olive tree. But then there's stone. And the stone is a big deal, too. Um, I just want to say it's kind of amazing to see a project around Palestine, just as, you know, as, as people also who are interested in this anti-colonial struggle, because I think that Palestine is also, if we kind of dig, you know, histories from the Bandung Conference, or that Palestine has always been this, a point of reference for the third world liberation front and the third world struggles and I think it's really nice to kind of because I've thought about it from like you know uh, a Palestinian context I would love to hear like for example for for like you know in in have you come across you know you know Palestine in the struggle in Vietnam for example right and so we all look at Palestine differently so would, I would love to hear like how you guys actually thought about Palestine yeah, I mean, Han and I have, um, you know, we've been working on projects that are kind of starting with our personal histories, but expanding from there. And I mean, we were just, I remember at some way we were looking at a lot of publications that were coming out from um, different, um, you know, former colonies and just so excited about the conversations that were happening amongst all of these um, come, you know, places, some that were still colonized, going through the process of decolonization, some that were, you know, um, that were decolonized. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, that was definitely something that I don't know if we knew it at the time that we were making this, but along the way, we've developed more in some of our collaborative work and in our own work, and it's definitely come back to this. Yeah, and I will just say too that, you know, the, you know, I, I love seeing, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of all your work and it's just incredible the way that you kind of tie, you know, you're able to sort of weave so many things together in both the activist work and the work that the visual work that you do. But I, you know, coming to this, to this, you know, to this history was something that was always sort of bound up, like Hong is saying, with like thinking about decolonization of Vietnam, but this question of, you know, which I love in that poster that you showed of anti-nationalism, internationalism. And that question to me is so central that I really, that, that, that drives me with a lot of the work that I do in my individual practice, but also informs the work that Hung and I do collectively is sort of thinking about how do we work through these histories of decolonization, which were such critical 
steps, right? But how do we how do we transgress and how do we get out of that model of thinking about, you know, what how you so eloquently described, you know, getting out of the framework of the nation state, like that we're so conditioned and that actually every liberation movement that we've that we've fought for has been within that framework, right? Um, I mean, you can see it even just with even thinking about Ukraine, you know, and just sort of the staunch nationalism that's coming out of our support of, of you know, kind of Western support for Ukraine. And so how do we get out of that language? So a lot of, I think what we are thinking about is sort of both like the critique of the state and its failures. And that's, I think a lot of what has, was, you know, kind of this project didn't, didn't necessarily like once, once we kind of got into the materials, we realized like, oh my God, like this is such a farce, like what the fuck? Like, this is so flimsy, like for, for you know, on the one hand, right? Like these people are just making these fucking decisions out of nothing. Um, and then at the same time that it's structuring reality so intensely and so um, so violently. And so I think part of it is in terms of like the way that we're thinking about, um, yeah, those these interconnected histories is both thinking about that solidarity, but also trying to think through, yeah, beyond Bandung, like how do we get beyond that, you know? And so for this project, it's um, it was a lot of sort of, both like sort of immersing ourselves into those materials um, and thinking about that historical moment, you know, even as, you know, my own relationship with Palestine and just sort of being an activist on the ground where I live and then trying to think through like, yeah, where did this all begin? You know, so it was a lot about for me just sort of also learning and educating myself. I think that's a Excellent. great point to Excellent end on, thought. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I just want yeah, so, so to share something. Eight. Go, go ahead. Steven, I just want to share something. John, John, I think I cited some of your work in an article that I wrote when I was still in the art world, when I was still in the law world in 2003. So I just shout out to the ongoing work. Good. Well, I, I hope what you cited didn't involve any mistakes on my part. No, I'm sure it didn't. <laughs> I also just want to say really quickly, Dr. Quickly, like your point also about the violence that would have ensued despite, you know, your your kind of like thinking about what would have happened if you and resolution hadn't passed, I think is really an important point because it one points out the the legitimization that the UN gave to all of the ensuing violence, right? The fact that we've got now whatever 80 years of, you know, state sponsored violence that's been legitimized. But the fact that actually the violence would have still happened despite that, um, I think is is like a really important point. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I don't think I'd ever said that before. It was you who brought that out for me. <laughs> Great, well, um, Layla, did you want to say anything to wrap up or? Yeah, no, I have nothing else to add other than that this was an incredible conversation and it was just so, it was enlightening in so many ways from all your different perspectives. And I feel like, you know, I've gotten to connect with some really incredible people through this project. So I just want to thank uh, Hung In and Hung again for the hard work they did here and uh, just the connections that they made with the community. Um, and that is, that's really all I've got. I have a lot to, I have to, um, <laughs> I guess, ruminate on from tonight. Um, yeah, does anybody else have anything to add? We're just grateful to be included in this conversation and honestly, thank everyone for the work. And, and every time Palestine comes up is an opportunity for us to bring other struggles because that's really the difference. I know. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I also uh, appreciate being asked to participate in this. I've learned a lot. It's been a very interesting uh, presentation. It's been, yeah, this has been so powerful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Spaces, once again, for making this happen, giving us the platform for this. Um, and I hope the conversation just continues. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank Likewise, you. thank you all so much. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.